Other positions obviously have been taken about how to reconcile evolution and Christianity. And one is simply to say evolution has to be wrong. And that is the creationist perspective. And I have great love and compassion and empathy for many believers who are in this camp, who have been led by uh, their own reading or by the teachings of others to believe that this is the only way one can be a faithful follower of Jesus Christ, is you have to defend the absolute literal truth of Genesis 1, or you've somehow started down a slippery slope that's going to lead you inexorably to denying the resurrection. I don't agree with that at all. And I found great comfort, in fact, in reading the interpretations of some of the most wise theologians who came along long before Darwin and therefore really had no reason why they had to apologize about evolution. And my favorite of those is St. Augustine. And I wish this statement were read more regularly uh, in, in many religious circles. And he's writing here, and, and Augustine was absolutely fixated, it seemed, on Genesis. He wrote five books about the interpretation of Genesis. And he struggled and he came up with various interpretations and I won't go through what they were, but I think the most important thing he said repeatedly in those books was, whatever your interpretation is, don't hang your hat on it too strongly because uh, no one can really figure this out from first principles. And he says, in matters that are so obscure and far beyond our vision, we find in Holy Scripture passages which can be interpreted in very different ways without prejudice to the faith we have received. In such cases, we should not rush in headlong and so firmly take our stand on one side that if further progress in the search for truth justly undermines this position, we too fall with it. And I think the creationist perspective runs that very serious risk. To put it somewhat harshly, I don't think you can be a young earth creationist without basically denying uh, the basic uh, principles of cosmology, physics, geology, chemistry, biology, paleontology. It's not tinkering around the edges that will get you there. And I think one of the great tragedies of our time is that that circumstance has not been addressed and admitted to. And so we are still asking young people to accept the idea of a, of a literal reading of Genesis 1. And then when they find out all of the facts of those sciences, they shake their heads and wonder, how can I accept a science that's telling me things that seem so counter to what my belief system told me? And for that matter, how can I accept a faith that tells me things that science seems uh, to completely contradict. This is not a way to draw people to faith. <laughs> and in fact, I think more and more young people simply turn away. Some of them turn away from faith, some away to turn away from science, some from both. And that's a terrible tragedy of our present time and a completely avoidable one. Another comment from St. Augustine. What kind of days these were is it is extremely difficult or perhaps impossible for us to conceive, talking about the days of creation. And of course, uh, Second Peter with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. How do we paint ourselves into this corner? And yet we have. The Gallup poll from just two years ago asked these questions. You could quibble about whether the questions were asked in a precise way, but I think it's pretty clear what they were trying to find out. Of the three options being provided here, 38% said human beings developed over millions of years. God guided the process. 13% uh, God had no part. But the largest percentage, 45%, God created human beings in their present form within the last 10,000 years. So in this country, despite what we as scientists have been discovering, we have been very unsuccessful in conveying that uh, to our friends and church-going uh, neighbors. What about intelligent design? Now here I know I'm getting a little closer to the edge uh, with an audience like this where probably uh, there are quite a few of you here, uh, perhaps uh, a lot of you, who are quite uh, attracted to this particular uh, possibility. Intelligent design is a very interesting arrival on the scene. It's, it's certainly raised a lot of interesting discussions about this concept of irreducible complexity. How is it that you could have something like the bacterial flagellum with its many different protein components where if you take one of them away, it stops functioning. Uh, so how could it be that evolution could actually generate something as complicated like that when you'd have to have 30 different proteins co-evolving and you'd gain no benefit until they'd all assembled together? That's the basic argument of irreducible complexity. And this is what uh, the uh, very thoughtful writings uh, of Johnson and Behe and Dembski and others have been about. And I think this has uh, provided a real opportunity to think about uh, these molecular machines and what might uh, be their possible explanation. 
But I fear that this is another proposal that is showing cracks already. Because if you look at the more recent data, now that we have lots and lots of genomes, so we can make lots and lots of predictions about these various uh, uh, protein complexes, including the bacterial flagellum, it does not appear that these emerged all of a sudden. In fact, what appears to be the case is that even a multi-protein wonder uh, like the flagellum was constructed by recruiting bit by bit proteins that had other functions. Presumably the genes for those proteins got duplicated, so the old function was maintained, but the new copy had a chance to take on a new function. And given sufficient time, which evolution offers you, I think the vast majority of biologists who have looked closely at this do not see any reason why one has to invoke a supernatural influence in order to achieve the complexity that we see in the clotting system or the eye or the bacterial flagellum. So my fear, although I've been very interested in this discussion, is that this is a God of the gaps theory, which is perhaps in record time because science is moving forward so quickly, going to be shown as such. And so if we as believers have attached our faith and tried to present our faith to others on the basis of this approach and it turns out to collapse, what have we then done? We've made God too small. We've put a God in a position of having to fix the evolutionary process that he didn't quite design right to begin with. And if that's turned out uh, not to be the case, then what has happened here? I think we have not really put science at any risk, although many scientists are running around complaining that intelligent design is a threat to them. I don't really think that's nearly as much of a concern from my perspective is how it could be a threat to faith, because I fear it's going to be wrong. The fifth option, and the last, and of course you can therefore guess it's the one I'm going to put forward as the one that I think makes perfect sense out of all this. And this is the option often referred to as theistic evolution, which is simply that God designed this process. He used it in a way to create creatures, including ourselves, with whom he could have fellowship. And I like this comparison of images. We humans have been searching for God and trying to depict him. Maybe all along he's been trying to show us uh, his incredible creativity. This is DNA looking down the long axis. And I have no problem uh, putting together what I know as a scientist with what I know about my faith in this particular context. So if God, who is not limited in space or time, chose to create human beings in his own image using the mechanism of evolution, who are we to say we wouldn't have done it that way? Unless you insist upon a literal reading of Genesis 1 and 2, this seems to me an entirely compatible description of what has happened. Now some people are worried, well, evolution seems so random. Well, to us, because we're trapped in this linear axis of time, but if God is outside of space and time, in the very moment of that flash that we call the Big Bang, he could also have the whole process worked out, including our having this conversation tonight, and it would not be random at all to him. For me, this provides an enormous sense of comfort, a harmony that I can't find in other ways, a way that draws me in the direction of worshiping an almighty God who has more creative power and majesty than I had ever imagined would be the case before these kinds of observations came along. I don't expect that this necessarily grabs onto everybody, but it does seem to me that this is a credible, intellectually defensible, and enormously comforting synthesis. <laughs>